All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Isaiah Stapleton. Uh, I'm Associate Software Engineer on the Red Hat Research Team. Um, I'm very excited to be talking to you today about open education in the New England uh, Research Cloud. Um, I've been working at Red Hat a little over a year now full time. So this is my first time giving a talk at a conference. So I'm very excited that you guys are uh, here with me today. Um, so what are we gonna be talking about today? Um, first, I'm gonna introduce what the Open Education Project actually is, um, and then what the New England Research Cloud is. Um, some big milestones we've had for the project, um, some new changes and improvements we've made to OPE, um, and then we'll talk about some future work, uh, how you can actually contribute to this project, because of course it is open source, and then we'll conclude the presentation and we'll go into a Q&A. All right, so the Open Education Project actually started by Professor uh, Jonathan Apabu at Boston University. Um, for his introduction to um, operating systems course. He found that um, the textbook and the materials that he used to teach operating systems didn't really suit the needs of his students. So he wanted to find a way to suit the needs of those students um, using uh, open source technologies. Um, and it won the uh, Red Hat Collaboratory Research Incubation Award in 2022 and 2023, which is where we got funding for this project. So the Open Education Project is essentially an initiative towards making education open source. Um, we leverage open source technologies to create an open platform where educators can create and publish uh, high quality open source materials and students require no more than access to a web browser to make use of those materials. So we've created a, a generalized SDK, uh, software development kit, where you can easily create uh, and publish um, textbooks and as well as containers that contain all the software needed to uh, follow along with the course and uh, do the assignments for the course. So we utilize the Jupyter ecosystem as well as other open tools. Um, we utilize, uh, for the textbook, we mainly use JupyterBook. For the container, we use uh, JupyterLab uh, RISE extension. Um, the RISE extension is basically a way to turn Jupyter Notebooks into uh, a presentation. So inside your container, the student can have um, their lab environment as well as um, being able to have presentations um, in that same environment. And then of course we use uh, Docker to actually containerize the application. Uh, for the uh, platform that we deployed on, we deploy it um, on OpenShift and OpenShift AI. Um, and with the Open Education Project, all changes to the textbooks and the containers are tracked by Git. They're hosted in a repository. Um, and this is very powerful because this allows uh, authors of these textbooks to uh, collaborate with each other. And it allows a history of changes made to the textbook um, to be seen. And this is also really powerful because the student can actually go into that repository and see um, the source material for the textbooks. And they can actually open issues or open pull requests to actually make changes to the textbook. So I know uh, Professor Jonathan Pavu and Ron Krieger, they actually offered extra credit to students that would open issues or uh, pull requests to their textbooks. Um, it really allows the students to become more hands-on with the material um, and just uh, become more involved in uh, the uh, their textbook and their learning materials. So the Open Ed Education Project actually uh, reduced costs and increases accessibility as well for the learners. Um, it reduced costs because now students don't need to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a proprietary textbook. Um, they, your textbook is open source, um, it's free. Um, and it also increases accessibility because um, all students need is access to a web browser. They don't need um, a computer or laptop with a lot of compute power, they only need uh, access to uh, a web browser. So you could even use something with, like a Chromebook um, with access to a web browser to access the container environment and use the compute power from the data center it's running on rather than your local laptop. Um, so this is um, uh, just an outline of the uh, repositories that we use in OPE. So we have different repositories like uh, tools repository, a container template, project template, et cetera. And then we have this OPE CLI tool, which I'll get more into soon. Um, but this OPE CLI tool basically um, pulls from these uh, different repositories and seeds a new uh, base OPE project. So base OPE project looks something like that at the top right. Um, it uh, has a content directory that contains um, examples and templates um, for the textbook. Um, it will have images, that's where you store all your images for the textbooks, your Python, any code that you want to be run inside the textbook, um, as well as the source content. And then we have a books and a containers directory where the actual books and containers are stored. And then the OP project repository at the bottom right is just our um, main repository that serves as an example of like what an OP project is. So we have a few books in there. We have a user guide. Um, the user guide is for people that are interested in using OP. Um, and we have a test book. I'll talk a little bit about that more soon. Um, we also have a contributor guide for those looking to contribute to uh, the OP project. Um, and we also have an authoring and uh, test containers. 
Um, so this is an example of, uh, so like I said, Jonathan Apavu, um, this kind of started because of his um, introduction to um, operating systems course, and this was his textbook that he made using JupyterBook. Um, so we're able to leverage JupyterBook to really create these really rich textbook environments. We can have code that can be run in line um, in the textbook. We can have multiple choice questions at the end of every section where students get immediate feedback for their answers. We can have videos, websites, simulators, LaTeX, we can have all of this in a single uh, textbook that, and it really creates this really rich uh, learning environment um, for the student. And then this is an example of the container um, environment that Jonathan Apavu used for his course. As you can see, um, if you're familiar with JupyterLab, they usually have a lot of features in there, um, but this one has been stripped down so that the student is only able to access the terminal. They can't access like the file browser or um, open um, any other types of files. They can only open the terminal. So it doesn't let them use like VS Code or these other higher level tools. It makes them really um, work their way up from the bottom. They have to learn how to use the terminal. They have to learn to use Git. They have to learn to use a text editor like Vim or Emacs. Um, and this kind of just outlines that open platform I was talking about. Um, we not only use open tools and open file formats, but the uh, cloud infrastructure that the uh, courses are run on um, are run on open data centers um, and using open source technologies uh, like OpenShift. Um, so this open data center actually refers to the New England Research Cloud. So what is an open data center? Well, an open data center is essentially just a data center that leverages open source technologies. Um, so the New England Research Cloud, you know, it runs uh, Linux machines for the servers, um, and they, for uh, server orchestration and management, we use OpenShift. Um, and the New England Research Cloud is part of the Mass Open Cloud. Um, the New England Research Cloud offers a range of services, uh, VMs using OpenStack, containers using OpenShift, an AI ML platform using OpenShift uh, AI, which is what we actually uh, deploy our uh, courses on. Uh, we heavily utilize OpenShift AI. And then open storage solutions using Nessie. So what are some big milestones for the project? Um, so this year was the first year that we ran courses in the New England Research Cloud. Before this year, before spring 2024, we were running all of our courses on AWS. Um, there are a few benefits to this. The first one is uh, it significantly reduced costs. So when we were running courses on AWS, it costed about $150 per student, but running it in the New England Research Cloud, it, offer, or it costs um, $18 per student. That is a significant uh, decrease in cost. Um, it also offers us greater flexibility. Um, rather than running um, on AWS, we have our own dedicated OpenShift cluster where we can more closely manage um, the workloads that the students are running. We also have a dedicated observability cluster. So this observability cluster provides us uh, information about resource usage um, for the classes, um, as well as um, resource uh, patterns. So you can see like when students are um, working on assignments and stuff like that. It's really useful not only for us, um, but it's also useful for uh, the professors as well. And like I said, um, this was the first year that we ran courses in the New England Research Cloud, and it was um, successful. Um, we ran three classes, CS210, EC440, and CS506, so two systems courses and a data science course. Um, across these three courses, we had over 500 students, and from the previous semesters when we were running on AWS, we had over 1,000 students. So we've now had almost 2,000 students that have um, successfully completed um, their courses in a cloud environment uh, utilizing OPE. So some new changes and improvements to OPE. Um, we now have a CI CD pipeline. So we utilize uh, GitHub Actions for the CI CD pipeline. So for the uh, container repository, if there's any changes made to that repository, any new code pushed in, it activates this GitHub workflow. This GitHub workflow builds the container and then runs different tests on that container. Um, it'll test for to make sure certain, uh, certain Jupyter packages are the correct version, uh, the UI is displaying correctly, certain Jupyter extensions are working as intended, um, and then after, uh, and more, and then after all the tests are run, um, it, if it passes, it gets pushed to a container registry. Uh, the container registry we use is Key.io. So we have a CI CD pipeline. We can test the container functionality, but we also need to make sure that that container works in the New England Research Cloud. Because you know, when, we, you, when you use GitHub Actions to build the container, it builds it in um, their own cloud instance. Uh, but we need to make sure that actually works in the New England Research Cloud. So after it's been pushed to Key.io, we then run that container in the New England Research Cloud, and we test for certain things. So this is where that test book that I mentioned before, we run this test book, and it tests for, um, to make sure the user ID, for example, is within an acceptable range for that cluster. 
Same for the group ID. Make sure certain group permissions are um, correct. Um, make sure that networking within the container is working in the cluster. Um, students can access the internet. Um, and then there's also specific tests for like specific classes. So like for the operating systems course, one test that was important for them is to make sure the container can make the appropriate system calls to do uh, to uh, disable address-based randomization when using GDB. Um, that's something that's important for a systems course. Um, and so that was just a test that was specific to that course. So when you use the OPCLI tool and you make a new project, you get uh, this test book and you can expand upon it or remove as needed for your specific use case. Uh, we also have tests for scalability. So we have uh, scalability tests that can start up a large number of pods, containers. Um, when I say pods or containers, I'm talking about the same thing. So when we have a test that can start up a large number of pods um, and we can see if there's any latency issues. Uh, when we were running these courses on AWS, we ran into um, issues where if a large number of students tried to start their containers at the same time, it would lead to delays of up to 20 minutes. Um, in the New England Research Cloud, we do not have any delays. We can start up hundreds of pods and we can have like no latency issues at all. Uh, another big thing was uh, reduce container image size uh, utilizing Docker multi-stage builds. Um, so the container size originally for the base OP image was a little over 10 gigabytes and now we have gotten it down to two to three gigabytes. This is really important because you know when a student starts up this container, it needs to build a container and if it's very large, like 10 plus gigabytes, it can take much longer to build a container. Getting it down to two or three gigabytes makes it very easy for a student to just start a pod um, and it gets built very quickly. We also have this customized image make target. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides, but essentially what it does is it, take, it takes an image that has already been built and customizes it, for, it changes some environment variables so that it can be deployed in a different environment. Um, we also have a cron job to shut down idle notebooks as well. So this kind of serves two purposes. So this was a feature requested by the professor uh, professors um, specifically because they want students to utilize Git. So they want students to make small incremental commits to their repositories rather than like one large commit the day before the assignment is due. So the professors can kind of see their um, start to finish for their project and not just all the work at the end. So, you know, we have this cron job that will shut down pods after a certain amount of time. So if a student works on something and they don't push their code, it gets deleted. They need to get used to pushing code uh, frequently. Um, and it all, the other purpose it serves is it uh, reduces uh, resource usage. You know, we don't want a ton of pods just sitting, not shut down, just taking resources and driving up the cost for the course. Um, and then we also have some mutating and validating webhooks, which I will talk more about in a few slides. Um, so we also have some usability tools. So I mentioned the OPCLI tool for you. The, using the OPCLI tool, you can very easily create uh, a new OPE project. You can add containers to it. You can add textbooks to it. You can build your textbooks. You can build your containers. And you can publish your containers in your textbook. You can do all this from the OPCLI tool. Um, and we originally used Make for that, but there was an intern, uh, Key Lee, who actually worked on this OPCLI tool. So you don't have to interface with Make. You can just um, get this OPCLI tool and use it that way. We also have an auto grader. So this auto grader runs in the same environment that the students are running their containers um, and is essentially a Flask uh, web um, application or web server. And the students can make a pull or uh, they can make a post request to the web server um, with the submission of their homework. So they can um, submit their homework to this auto grader. It will send them back their um, results and then it will also send it to Gradescope so that the professors or the TAs can see the results of uh, the students' submissions. Um, so like I said, uh, this is just showing the OPE CLI tool. You can do all of these um, things um, just with the CLI. And then this just shows um, kind of the architecture for the auto grader, but basically the auto grader is running in the same environment as the students are running uh, their containers in and it will send uh, the results to grade scope so the professors and TAs can see. And so what are some challenges that we have had? Um, so separations of notebooks in the same namespace. So originally each class was running their own data science project. A data science project is a feature of Red Hat OpenShift AI where you are able to run your AI ML workloads and your containers. Um, so originally we were going to do that because it's each data science project is like its own namespace. So it's like we wanted each class to be in their own namespace essentially. But the issue with this is using data science projects, um, students can access all notebook instances within that namespace. So you can see here, like in a data science project, you can see all the containers running. 
Um, if you were a student, you'd be able to go into somebody else's container and see the work that they're doing and just copy them. Obviously, we don't want that. So what we did instead is we switched to using the Rhodes Notebooks namespace, all the classes running in one namespace. Um, this is an older feature of uh, Red Hat OpenShift AI, um, but essentially students can just select what image they want, um, the container size, as well as if they need a GPU, um, and start the image up that way. But like, how do we identify which users belong to which classes if everybody's running in the same namespace? And how do we ensure that the students are using the right image and the right resource sizes um, if they can just select whatever they want. Well, for identifying which users belong to which classes, we use a mutating webhook, and for ensuring the students are running the right uh, images and resources, we use a validating webhook. So when a student requests to create their uh, container or their pod, it runs through these different stages. When it gets to the mutating and mission stage, um, we have a mutating webhook that is also a Flask web server that intercepts the request for the pod to be created, and it checks to see if the user um, so actually before this runs, we have a script that we run at the beginning of the semester to add the users um, to the respective OpenShift group that pertains to their class. So like an EC440 student will be in the EC440 group. So this webhook, this mutating webhook, will basically check to see if that user is in any of those groups. If they are, it will just add a label to that pod. Class equals EC440, for example. Then when you get to the validating admission stage, we have a validating webhook that is, we use a gatekeeper for this. It will basically check that class label. If a user is in EC440, then it will say, you have to have this image, the EC440 image, extra small resource size, and you're not allowed a GPU. If all these conditions are not met, the request for the pod to be created is not accepted, and the student will get um, a message explaining why um, they can't create this pod. So that's how we ensure that students are running the right images, and that's how we um, can ensure that we can differentiate between uh, different users of different classes in the same namespace. We also have this versionitis issue. So versionitis basically is just when newer versions of packages don't work well together. Um, and so like, for example, um, if I built a container in January and I didn't specify the exact versions of the packages that I wanted, say in January everything worked together, if I built that same image today, we might run into some issues because newer versions of packages might have issues with each other. Um, so we had two solutions for this. The make customized target, um, I mentioned this a little bit, but the specific use case that we needed this for was we were running courses on AWS in fall of 2023 and we wanted that same image in the New England Research Cloud for spring 2024. But when you're deploying to a new environment, you need to uh, make sure it adheres to the requirements of that environment. So the make customized target, basically you point it to an image that has already been created, and rather than like rebuilding all the packages and the software, um, it just changes the environment variable so that it can um, be run in that new environment. So that was the one use case that the make customized target was for, but the other thing is like you're not always gonna have an image that you already have working, you're gonna want to build new containers. So we now use um, specific package versions that we know work well together, and if we want to upgrade to a newer version of a software package, um, we have to go and um, manually like change it and then run it through that CI CD pipeline to make sure everything is working. Um, so some future work for this project. Um, we had an intern, Mira, who's here. Um, she worked on the OPE tool um, over the summer and um, she had the idea to turn it into a Jupyter extension. So rather than having to work or use the OP tool through the CLI, you could just use it through a Jupyter extension and you can just click and do all those things that the OP CLI tool can do. Um, we also wanna work more closely with Red Hat OpenShift AI team to make changes in that product that are beneficial to the OP project. So like I explained before, um, the way they run workloads in data science or in Red Hat OpenShift AI through the data science projects doesn't really fit our use case because um, Every student can see the other student's containers. That's not good, they can just go in there and copy their work. Um, but we also don't want students long-term, we also don't wanna run these classes long-term in the Rhodes Notebooks namespace because you know, all the classes are in one namespace. We would like to have the separation in the different namespaces, but we don't really have that ability um, in Red Hat OpenShift AI at the moment. So we wanna work more closely with the team um, to make sure that um, they make changes in their product that work for us. Um, and we have already been working with them um, to try to get that change implemented into the product. And we also just wanna get more classes running in the New England Research Cloud. We actually had a group of students from um, Beijing come and visit us recently um, that were interested in using uh, OPE um, in their school. And they uh, 
they were very interested and they went back and were talking to their professors. Um, so we might get um, some people over there that are interested in using OPE um, and running their classes that way. Um, we also had a professor, Thomas McKenna, who runs this pretty popular website for science-based phenomena um, for teaching like science. Um, and he was interested in utilizing OPE as well. So um, yeah, we just wanna get more people, um, more classes running in the New England Research Cloud. We wanna get more contributors um, working on OPE. Um, so how can you contribute? Um, we have our GitHub organization on GitHub, uh, OP Effort. We also have, um, you can see all the repositories um, through that link, but we also have our main repo that I mentioned before, OP project that serves as an example of an OP project, as well as it has a readme. Um, and we have the container repo, which is where the base OP uh, container comes from. Tools repo where the OP tool um, and other tools are. And we also have this user and contributor guide if you're interested in using uh, OPE, this user guide will guide you through it and a contributor guide will guide you through contributing. Um, and then there's also this, um, I recorded this 25 minute demo where we go more in depth into how to actually use OPE. Um, I, I was more talking about it today, but if you're actually interested in using it, I think the demo is um, gonna be a really good resource so you can actually see how to do all these things. It goes over um, seeding a new um, open education project, building containers, um, building textbooks and populating those and then publishing those. Um, the links are here, but you can also just Google Open Education Project and Red Hat Research, one of the first links will be there and you can see the OPE demo on that page. So in conclusion, uh, the Open Education Project is essentially just uh, initiative to try to open source education. We have a set of tools that we have created that make it very easy to uh, create textbooks and create containers and publish those. Um, and also a set of tried and tested methods for running courses using OP um, in a cloud environment. Um, so that is all. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me now. We have, I think, 10 minutes-ish to ask questions, but then if you have any other questions, you can also contact me at my email there. Yes, Mira. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was your main approach in making the container images smaller? Because that was a really significant decrease. Yeah, so um, so we utilize Docker multi-stage builds, which basically, like, when you have Docker images and you're building these artifacts, there can be a lot of artifacts that are left over that are unneeded. And the way Docker works is it basically layers these different, like, layers on top of each other, and you can have multiple copies of artifacts over different stages of the build. So we utilize multi-stage builds to so basically in the first stage we'll build all of our stuff and then we'll take the artifacts that you need into the next stage. Um, and a tool I used um, for seeing these artifacts that are left over um, between these different layers was this tool called Docker Dive, um, which lets you jump into a container um, that has already been built and see um, in each layer like what artifacts are there and how many like copies of it is. There, there is. So I had to, that, that was the main tool that helped me a lot to kind of um, figure out which artifacts are being duplicated and yeah. Hi, nice presentation. So I have two questions. Uh, in slide one, you talked about accessibility, how this migration was more accessible than the earlier one. Uh, can you elaborate on that? And the second one was, uh, was about uh, the cost factor from $18 per student, to, from 150 to 18. So is it per course, per uh, year? Is it by, um, so that's that's over the semester. It was uh, $18 a student. Um, and then I think your first, question was um, about accessibility. About accessi increased accessibility. Yeah, How so, does it so, so yeah, talking about the increasing uh, accessibility for students, um, like I said, um, the rather than you having to have um, a laptop that has a lot of compute power, say for example you're doing a data science course. A data science course might need uh, a GPU, for example, or they, might, they just might need more compute power. Um, not everybody can afford a laptop that can run these workloads that are needed for certain courses and um, uh, certain assignments. Um, so rather than you know having to have a expensive laptop or a computer that can do this, um, all they need is access to a laptop that can reach this 
uh, website that they can just spin up the container and then they can use the uh, compute power of the data center that it's running on rather than the compute power of their own local laptops. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. I understand that this project is currently being used in universities, but are there plans to expand it into primary education? Um, so not right now, um, only because we're trying to get, we're still trying to improve upon what we already have. Um, and the New England Research Cloud is mainly for um, like higher education academic institutions. Um, so, you know, that's not really something we're focusing on right now, but the work that, like I mentioned, uh, Thomas McKenna, who's a BU professor and he has a website, um, that website for science-based phenomena, um, that's used by primary, uh, primary school educators. Um, and so he himself might utilize OPE to help um, those uh, primary school educators, um, but it's not something we're necessarily uh, like focusing on or targeting at the moment. So is this program in, has been is being implemented uh, only in certain universities or all universities in? Yeah, so um, right now, all those courses that I mentioned, um, uh, all these courses have been running at BU. Um, so this started at BU, um, and we've only um, had BU courses running um, on this. But we have had interest from Northeastern as well. I believe they're interested in using it for the fall semester, um, but I'm not certain at the moment if they are going to actually use it for the fall semester. Um, but yeah, so far we've only had BU courses being run um, using OP in the New England Research Cloud, but we've had talks with other universities that are interested in using it. Well, there's no more questions. Thank you everybody for attending today. <laughs>